Hello everybody. I'm sure you've heard about the Soviet Union. It was the greatest attempt at socialism in the last century. Or maybe it was just an oppressive state capitalist system. There was no better than our current capitalist states. And perhaps you have some third opinion and everyone hates you. No matter which opinion you hold, you can't deny that the Soviet Union plays a major part in the history of socialism and that understanding it is really important if you want to have informed conversations about what it was, what it was good and what it could and should have done differently as well as what we can learn from it to improve our future attempts at socialism. This is why in this video I will do my best to explain the inner workings of the Soviet Union. A state typically has three interesting to discuss areas, the political system, the economy and the military. Because this channel and this video are mainly focused around economics and politics, I made the executive decision to ignore the Red Army for this video. This means I will talk about the political and economic system of the USSR. Note that the Soviet Union existed for a long time, from 1922 to 1991 to be exact, that's 69 years. Pretty much everything about the economic and political system was subject to change at some point. I will try my best to mention everything as well as I can. It's not going to be easy because this is very complicated. But that being said, let's start. Here in the former Western Bloc, we usually never talk about the way the Soviet government actually worked. It's called a one-party state or a dictatorship all the time. Oftentimes, the Soviet Union is treated like a fascist empire in which the general secretary could do whatever he wanted. And Yes, it's he, all of them were men. Before I mentioned that the Soviet Union was around from 1922 onwards, a few of you will have noticed that that's a little odd because the October Revolution happened in 1917. Why is that? Well, as you know, before the revolution there was the Tsarist Empire of Russia. This empire was majority Russian but had a lot of non-Russian minorities in it, notably Ukrainians, Belarusians, Finnish and more. When the Tsar was overthrown in the February Revolution, the Tsarist Russian Empire was replaced by the Russian Provisional Government. In October, but actually in November because of calendars, Lenin and the Bolsheviks overthrew the Provisional Government and replaced it with the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. That was the name of the country. This was the flag and their anthem was this. The entirety of the old Russian Empire was now part of this Russian Soviet Republic. A lot of things happened in the aftermath of the revolution and the can't really do us justice in this video, so we will skip along to 1922. Remember when I told you that the Russian Empire had many non-Russians in it? Well, so did the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, because it was the same country geographically speaking, uh, except without Finland. And that's not great, because all these minorities are having to share one government with the Russians, who outnumbered all minorities. And the way they solved this was to form the Soviet Union in the Treaty of the Creation of the Soviet Union. This gave every notable minority their own socialist republic. There was a Russian Soviet Socialist Republic, a Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, a Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic and so on. And all of those republics had many special rights and their own governments, but they were still united under the single government of the Soviet Union. That's why it was called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. It was a union made up of many Soviet republics. It worked kind of like the USA, having multiple states which were all united under a federal Soviet government. Let's now look at how those republics worked. Every republic was special and they all had small differences, but in general they operated similarly. I will be focusing on the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic now because it was the biggest and most central one. There were two main government organs, the Council of Ministers of the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic and the All-Russian Congress of Soviets. Uh, and yes, I know that the Russian Soviet Federative Republic used this flag, but all flags of the member states of the USSR look the same, so I'm using their modern flags instead. The All-Russian Congress of Soviets was, unsurprisingly, the main legislative body in the Russian Soviet Republic. This means they were tasked with making laws. Those laws were only specific to Russia and did not affect the other Soviet republics. They also appointed the Council of Ministers. As you can tell, this was quite an important organization. So, who was in charge of it? Essentially, Soviets. 
A Soviet is a form of workers' council. So, for example, all of the fishers in Leningrad may form the Soviet of Leningrad's fishers. During the Russian Revolution, many such Soviets were formed by workers all around Russia. Those Soviets then sent delegates to the Congress. So it was a republic ruled by representatives of Soviets. A Soviet Republic. So essentially, the people joined Soviets, elected a delegate, and that delegate then had a seat in the Congress and voted on laws, as well as who would be on the Council of Ministers. Problem with this Congress was that they met very infrequently oftentimes just twice a year for just a few days. So to replace them in their absence, the members of the Congress voted on some of them to be in the Central Executive Committee, which took over the tasks of the Congress while it was not in session. The Congress also selected the judges on the High Court of the Russian Socialist Republic. The legal system in the USSR worked very similarly to the one in other European countries like Germany and France. Judges were elected for a five-year term and the purpose of the court was to interpret the law. So the workers were in Soviets, which sent representatives to the Congress, which then voted on a small group of people to be ministers, a group of people to be judges on the high court, and another group of people to be in the executive committee, which took over the lawmaking while the Congress was not in session. As you can tell, this is quite an indirect form of government with a lot of representatives and less direct democracy. You may be critical of this, but keep in mind that according to the vanguardist beliefs, most of the people at the time were not yet capable of leading their country. So representatives, aka the Bolsheviks, had to lead the government. Uh, that's the justification that was used. Also, uh, because Soviets were associations of workers, this was a way to manifest the dictatorship of the proletariat. They only wanted working people to take part in the government after all. And the way to do that was to require everyone who wanted to have any influence in politics to be part of a Soviet. Let's now look at the second part of the Russian Soviet government, the Council of Ministers. It was made up of multiple ministers and it was the executive branch of the government. That means laws were decided by the Congress and it was the job of the ministers to put those things into practice. The ministers and tasks shifted a lot, but for example in 1924 they had 11 ministers with the following tasks. Domestic trade, labor, finance, workers and peasants inspection, internal affairs, justice, enlightenment, healthcare, agriculture, social security and supreme council of the national economy. As you can see, those were quite a lot of tasks given to the Russian government. Note, the Soviet Union had no or very little influence on these topics because they were delegated to the Soviet republics. This way, it was a more decentral system which can take into account the will of minorities rather than having a big government in Moscow telling everyone how to run their socialist republics. And that's how the individual Soviet republics worked. If only it was that simple. In 1937, the All-Russian Congress of Soviets was disbanded and replaced by the Supreme Soviet of Russia. The same was done in all of the Soviet republics at this time as Stalin and his government were working on reforming the Soviet constitution in 1938. The main difference was that doing away with the Soviets and just having local elections for representatives. The rest of the tasks were still the same. They still elected the ministers and they still elected a group of people to replace their functions when the Congress was not in session. This time called the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet. But besides that, it was pretty much the same thing as the previous Congress. So now, people take part in elections, elect representatives who join the Congress, the members of the Congress elect ministers, they elect high judges, and they elect a group of people that take over the jobs of the Congress while it's out of session. That is a brief overview of the way the governments of the individual Soviet republics worked. Every single one of the Soviet republics had basically this structure. Let's now see how they were all united under the federal government of the Soviet Union in Moscow. By 1922, the supreme governing body of the Soviet Union was the All-Union Congress of Soviets, also known as just Congress of Soviets. The main powers of this Congress included amending the constitution of the USSR, admission of new republics into the USSR, establishment of the principles of plans for development of the Soviet economy and state budget of the USSR, that means five-year plans mainly, and approval of general principles of current legislation, that means making new laws. This Congress was made up of representatives which were once again sent out by the workers' Soviets. They selected judges for the High Court of the USSR, again with the five-year term limit. 
and they also elected a committee to take over the tasks of the Congress when it was not in session, this time called the All-Union Central Executive Committee. Interestingly, this committee had more power than the Congress itself, and that was the power to elect the members of the Council of People's Commissars. Those were the ministers. This time, the ministers which concerned the entire Soviet Union. For example, the Minister of Defense or Foreign Relations. You know, the ones the individual Soviet republics couldn't take care of. Fun fact, the Central Executive Committee and the Council of Commissars were the most powerful positions, but they didn't have an official leader among them. There was a head of state and a head of government at some point, but for the majority of the Soviet Union, there were no such positions. Now, you may say that the General Secretary was the head of the state, and that may be true, but General Secretary was not a government position, it was a party position. So all of the Soviet leaders we know are officially described as that leaders of the government, because there was no head of state and no head of government, only unofficial leaders. The official head of government was the executive committee, also sometimes called the Politburo. So the way this federal Soviet system worked was that a worker joined the Soviet, the Soviet sent a representative to the Congress of Soviets, where they elected the central committee, which then selected the ministers. As you can tell, this is quite a vertical state. Again, the idea is that socialism needs an educated ruling class to be reached, which is why it was organized this way. And that's how it worked until 1936, when the Congress was abolished, making this video even more complex. Uh, but the reason is actually pretty understandable. Remember when I said that the Soviet Union had many minorities in it, and that the Congress, the big Soviet government all republics had to listen to, was elected by Soviets. Uh, but since everybody could join a Soviet, it was theoretically elected directly by the population. Direct representative parliaments and minorities don't go well together, because, of course, the majority of voters were Russians. Most representatives were Russians, which could lead to minorities like Ukrainians being ignored in the Congress because they made up a political minority. The fix was the system which came to replace the Congress of the Soviet Union, and that was the Supreme Soviet of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The way they solved the minority ignoring issue was by giving the governing body two chambers, the Soviet of the Union and the Soviet of Nationalities. I will go into what those individual ones did in a second. For now let's discuss what the Supreme Soviet as a unit did. It was the supreme legislative body, meaning it was the only place allowed to make laws for the entire Soviet Union. It could also make changes to the constitution and it appointed ministers. So this time the democratic body itself appointed ministers, instead of appointing someone who would appoint someone. They also only met two times a year, so you guessed, they elect the presidium of their members for the time the Supreme Soviet was not in session. This presidium was elected by a joint session of both chambers of the Supreme Soviet and had the power to make laws in the form of presidium decrees. These laws had to be approved by the next session of the Supreme Soviet. This means the presidium was able to work around the slow democratic process when necessary, while not having dictatorial power. This is a lot like how executive orders work in an American democracy. So how did the Supreme Soviet work? As I said, it was made up of two different chambers, Soviet of the Union and Soviet of Nationalities. Essentially, the Soviet of the Union was elected by the people. At this point, the Soviets were ignored and representatives were elected by local areas. About 300,000 people got one representative. This was a chamber in which the will of the Soviet people was equal, directly proportional to population. But as I mentioned, that can be bad for minorities, so the Soviet of Nationalities was established. This chamber had 32 deputies from each republic, as well as some deputies from autonomous regions, but let's ignore that. Because of this, both Russia and Estonia had 32 representatives, which was done to ensure that ethnic minorities would have a bigger say in the Soviet democracy. So the Supreme Soviet consisted of two chambers, both of which had to work together to pass laws, resolutions and whatever they wanted to pass to make it law. They also changed the Council of People's Commissars to the Council of Ministers, which is a better and more descriptive name. And that's the way the Soviet government worked. At least until Gorbachev came along and changed uh, everything shortly before destroying the Union, but I will not get into the dissolution of the Soviet Union today. So here comes a short summary of the way the Soviet state worked for most of its history. You start with a person. They take part in two elections. One election for the Supreme Soviet of the Soviet Union and one election for the Supreme Soviet of their Soviet Republic, for example Russia. 
The Supreme Soviet of Russia then selects some of its members to be in the Presidium of Russia, which takes over the tasks of the Supreme Soviet of Russia when it's not in session. And they also select the ministers for that specific Soviet Republic. They select judges for the High Court of Russia, as well as sending representatives to the Soviet of Nationalities, which is part of the Supreme Soviet of the entire Union. The other chamber of the Supreme Soviet is filled with representatives the person voted for. Those two chambers together then make laws for the USSR, change the constitution, appoint high court judges of the entire union and elect the presidium which replaces them for one not in session, as well as selecting ministers which are concerned with the entire Soviet Union rather than just a member republic. And that is a simplified explanation. Now this sounds all nice and democratic, right? Sure, it's very vertically structured, but it's fundamentally still a democracy. And this is where people will mention that it was a one-party state. Which significantly restricted the democratic freedom. And that's true. Remember how originally the workers' Soviet sent representatives to the Supreme Congress and the Congress of the Local Socialist Republic? And how that was the way they made sure it was exclusive rule by the workers? Well. When they changed to a system in which they had regular closed ballot elections, the way they made sure that only workers' interests were represented was by making all the candidates member of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. After all, the Communist Party is not capitalist. So in their eyes, a good way to prevent counter-revolutionary votes was to ban all parties considered capitalist. But wait, banning capitalist parties would still allow for multiple socialist parties, right? Well, no. The Bolsheviks didn't approve of other socialist parties. The logic was that if they were true socialists, they would unite with the Bolshevik party. And if they didn't do that, they must have been counter-revolutionary or at the very least creating instability by forming a second party. The party line on this was that a one-party state is functionally the same as a no-party state. Let me explain. In a no-party state, everybody can run for election, anyone can be voted for, and everyone, including representatives, makes choices to the best of their knowledge without joining parties, because parties would cause unnecessary infighting in the state. So the way this can be seen is that the Communist Party of Russia wanted to functionally facilitate partyless democracy. That's why they dislike factionalism that much, uh, because having factions creating a communist party would effectively have the same downsides as multi-party democracy. So in the eye of the communist party of the USSR, this was a perfect democracy because anyone could stand for election provided they joined the party and anyone could hold any opinions provided they didn't seek out factionalism. Personally, I'm still not convinced that the Soviet Union was a perfectly democratic because the party had an official party line which inherently limited the opinions party members could share and that's kind of a core problem of using a one-party system as a makeshift no-party system. Though I see how in the eyes of the party they were just as democratic as the United States or Western Europe. Let's now move on to the economy of the Soviet Union. <laughs> The USSR is often called state capitalist. The explanation goes that it wasn't socialism because the workers didn't own the means of production, but the state did, which functionally makes the state the capitalist. I don't like this view. For one, it causes infighting and I believe the left achieving things as a united front in reality right now is more important than arguing about economic details of a country that ceased to exist 30 years ago. That being said, here is why I still disagree with the term state capitalism. The incentives of a capitalist are to squeeze as much money as possible out of the workers, to make as much money as possible. That money is then spent on the capitalists themselves. In the Soviet Union, the money created by the economy was taken by the state. That's true. But what did the state spend the money on? Ultimately, in most cases, it was things which helped the Soviet people. Roads, factories, schools, free healthcare. So the state socialist system, the profit the state makes, is ultimately spent on the people in ways it would never be in a capitalist system. That's why I prefer to call it state socialist and dislike the term state capitalist. That tangent being over, how did the Soviet economy work? The Soviet economy, that being all factories, farms and so on, were owned by the state, as you probably already know. Mostly, because sometimes property was not owned by the state, but by cooperatives. Notably, housing was often in the hands of the housing cooperatives. That means the housing belonged to those who lived in it rather than the state. The industry was mostly owned by the state though, and of course they had to plan how things were going to work. That was the task of the state planning committee, called Gosplan. And amazingly it was one organization, from the forming of the Soviet Union to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So this part of the video will be a lot more straightforward. 
Gosplan was the central part of the planning committee of the USSR. It was tasked with keeping track of what the Soviet economy produced as well as planning what the economy would produce, as well as providing raw materials needed for that production. The way Gosplan worked was super complicated, but I'm gonna try my best to explain it. It's got its orders from the Council of Ministers, remember the ministers who worked directly for the federal government. Gosplan was internally divided into different departments like coal, iron, machine production and so on. The industry goals written by Gosplan were pretty broad. Those goals were then handed to the ministers of the economy, both the federal Soviet ministers and the local ministers of the individual socialist republic. And those ministers would, based on the plans made by Gosplan, further subdivide the goals on a regional level, which then told the individual factories and cooperatives what the production targets would be. This image sums it up pretty much. We have the federal ministers here, who give orders to their ministers, as well as orders to the ministers of the Republic, who then give orders to their ministries, which give orders to the regional Soviet, which orders around the city Soviet, which gives orders to the district Soviet, which then tells the enterprises what to produce. Farming was organized into collective farms and state farms. A similar system existed for enterprises. Uh, some were state-owned, some were cooperatives. That's pretty much it. The economy is a lot more straightforward than the political system, as you can see. In conclusion, uh, pretty interesting, I guess. Uh, you can see how the Soviet state was built up as a fundamentally democratic and at least nationally decentralized state. But that this democracy was sort of undermined by the interests of the party which ruled it. We can also clearly see Leninist influence after which an elite of the vanguard party should lead the country. That's why the presidiums and ministers are never directly voted on. They're all selected by the parliament. Whether this was a necessary thing is debatable. After all, the average Russian peasant in 1930 didn't necessarily know who would be the best for running the socialist country. But on the other hand, this made the Soviet government inherently distanced from the people it ruled, which ultimately played a major role in the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that's really pretty much everything I have to say. Thanks for watching. As you may know, I was on a break before this video. I will leave a pinned comment below explaining how I will deal with the channel and the video making process in the future. TLDR, there will be videos in the future, so subscribe. I also started doing random live streams on my other channel, Wiki2000. Uh, if you want to see those, feel free to subscribe there. Since my last video, I've gotten a lot of new patrons and I'm really thankful for your support through this. Let's be honest, not easy time for me. Uh, so I would like to thank all of my patrons and especially Comrade Asshole, Eric Betts, Mushavir Razif, Alki, Darius the Bird, Noah, Daniel Hyman, Bryn Flores, L. L. Brown, Masijek Rojek, Stairmaster Chef, Trey, Hurlington Gurdington, Glastrop, Morally Conflicted Tortoise, and Tyler Dang. If I mispronounced any names, please send me a PM on Patreon. And that's all. Thanks for watching.